And then Corey. So, um, as a student who helped bring Dershowitz to Brandeis, um, I just, I, I have a question about your suggestion um, with regards to Hasbara or whatever you want to call it, combating. Um, I mean, the, the, the challenge is really, um, the, the playing field is, is 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 one thing when you're dealing with, you know, Norman Finkelstein, whatever. When you're dealing with an American president um, who you know makes the kinds of claims that he makes um, in his book, and you know, 40 news organizations show up to your campus, um, you know, anything that that you know you say doesn't seem to really like you know you can have as many protesters outside as you want, but it doesn't it doesn't quite do it. Like, you know, that's legitimacy. You know, there's only, what, three American presidents who are alive? Or, uh, you know, the, right? So it, it's just, I think that there needs to be some sort of paradigm shift in or how we deal with, um, you know, this, this kind of situation. Um, and I don't know if you have any suggestions. Look, I don't have any good suggestions, but I want to give you guys a sense of perspective. <laughs> I'll give you a sense of perspective. It's battle after battle after battle is how you win a war. <clears throat> so you can lose the Carter thing in the short run. It's okay. Let him get a lot of press. Let him sell a lot of books. It's okay. You just keep chipping away, and you're gonna get. We're gonna get our breaks too. In other words, there will be, you know, he will get delegitimized at some point. Um, and if it's not directly because of this, it'll be because of something else. Um, you know, I for one, I know that people that I respect very much. I mean, for example, Elie Wiesel thinks very highly of Kofi Annan. But I take that seriously. I take Elie Wiesel very seriously. So if he thinks highly of Kofi Annan, I gotta think about that. But I despise Kofi Annan because I think that he was viciously anti-Israel. So that, for example, when the attack in, when the, when the, the battle took place in Jenin and the world accused Israel in 2002, I think it was, of uh, having done a massacre, and Israel said there was no massacre. And the French press said there was, and the German press said there was, and some of the American press said there was, and all over Europe, everybody said there was. Kofi Annan came out and said, what? The entire world is wrong and Israel is right? And then he went ahead and appointed an, 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 an uh, you know, a commission of inquiry and it proved that there was no massacre. Kofi Annan never said a word. The right thing to do would have been to say, I was wrong. Okay? But Kofi Annan didn't have the guts, there's a better word to use, but I won't use it, right? Kofi Annan didn't have the guts to come out and say, I was wrong. For, that, that was one of many different examples. I actually think that he was a disaster. The, uh, Elie Wiesel says he was very good on anti-Semitism around the world. That may be. I don't know that much about that. On Israel, I think he was a disaster. This new guy actually seems to me to be pretty good. Hmm. Now, so you could have three or four years ago said, the United Nations is a Farfal and Azaf. We're losing, we're losing. Okay, but nobody's forever. And the United Nations seems to have appointed a guy who actually, so far, gives us signs for great hope. Now, like you could have said um, in previous years, um, the American president is not strongly enough supportive of Israel. Then you got George Bush, and you got a lot of other things with George Bush. But you did get a guy who I think on a certain level, certain level, gets it. I actually think that in his last speech you went too far, because it's so black and white that serious people can't really get their arms around what he said. All right, but now you may go into a dark age, depending who gets elected in the next American presidential election. We may be in it for a, a very rough spell. Who's the but, dark age? I don't know who the dark age is. You know, whatever. It's a lot of, you got, Baruch Hashem got a lot of options on that one. Okay? But we may be in for a bad spell. Four years, eight years, whatever. I don't know. Okay, but we got to remember, there's cycles in this thing. I think that you win the war with, with your eye on the very, very long ball. You do not, you do not, you know, you, you lose battles in the interim. And I know it's frustrating when Carter gets all the press that he gets and you do whatever you do and you bring those with nobody takes notice or whatever the case. I, I understand that. I understand that. But I'll give you an example. Norman Finkelstein did not get tenure at DePaul. Now, you might say, okay, well, who cares? I mean, what's DePaul? It's some dumpy little Catholic university who's normal thinkers. Well, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing, because he was going to get tenure. He was going to get tenure. And actually, I think Alan Dershowitz had a little bit to do with it, and a lot of other people did too. No, I think he had a little bit. I don't really think it was his doing, because it could have cut both ways. 
he could have actually, you know, DePaul could have decided to show that its academic autonomy was not going to be buffeted by some guy from Harvard. So, not sure how much he had to do with it, but it certainly helped, I think. But at the end of the day, Norman Finkelstein did not get tenure at DePaul. Now, you may not know where DePaul is, you may not know who Norman Finkelstein is, but that's a small little Catholic university, and he's a Fashtunk and a Mensch, a Jewish guy, a Jewish guy who writes about the Holocaust industry and all this kind of stuff. Now, that's a huge victory for us, because it begins to say to American professors across the whatever, if you simply trash Jews and Israel with no kind of academic rigor, actually, we're going to find you. And we're going to begin to change the discourse on American campuses. Now, I know that Columbia, you know, my alma mater, is not a happy place to be a Zionist these days. I understand that. Okay, so you got to fight that. Little by little, by professor by professor. It doesn't mean these professors should be fired. Right? And Edward Said was teaching when I was there. Okay? A great professor of literature. A really crappy read of, of politics. But by the way, not wrong entirely that the Palestinian people were suffering. That's where we went wrong, by the way. We decided the best argument is that they're suffering. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's a whole big thing brewing. I got a call right before I came in to teach you guys, and I had to call me back later. They're doing an article for the Jerusalem Report about this whole question of Israeli textbooks now acknowledging the Nakba, you know, the catastrophe in 48. Well, yeah, I mean, I can say catastrophe, but it, it, it was a catastrophe in a certain level. And the Israeli Arabs have it's suffered here. here. What's that? Yeah. Oh. Israeli Arabs have suffered here. And I don't think that a Jew worth his or her salt with a Jewish bone in their body ought to say either that they're not suffering or it's entirely their fault. Yeah, a lot of it's their fault. There was a, there was a partition plan and they did say no to it. They did start a war and they did lose it. I grant you all of that's true. I, that's all true. But it hasn't, been, it hasn't been a cakewalk for them. And we haven't maybe tried to make it a cakewalk. Maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, I think somewhat wrongly, somewhat smartly, but whatever. It's complicated. Right? And we have, I think, sometimes not done ourselves the best because we've been thinking that the best defense is a really strong offense. We're all right, they're all wrong. But nobody's seriously going to buy that anymore. Nobody's seriously going to buy that. And so I, I was just when it comes to the Carter, the Carter, Dershowitz kind of stuff, think also about Norman Finkelstein. And think about a lot of other places where we're, we're not falling apart at the seams. We're actually having, we're making advances. And uh, there is no country more hospitable to a decent, legitimate intellectual argument than America is. It is the best place to have this argument if you have to have it. And I believe that at the end of the day, when people realize what Jimmy Carter has really both directly advocated and indirectly advocated, he will not stand the test of time. He won't. Right, but it's, it's frustrating in the middle of it. Of course it's frustrating. I grant you. I grant you. And it's a hell of a lot better on Brandeis' campus uh, than it is in other places. It's a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. Guys, we need to keep our questions very short and concise because we want to squeeze in a few more before Dr. Gordas has to take off. Um, Adam and then out to Corey. Uh, 